So welcome church. Today we're starting our series on discovering God's purpose. And as you all know that it takes grace to be able to share or teach what sometimes takes a lifetime to learn in 40 minutes. So please be patient with me and I'm learning that sometimes I just have to break down a little bit of my message and finish it the next Sunday because there's so much to say. God has a plan for each and every one of you, and that plan is good. God has thought into every detail of your life. He even thought into when I got my first ticket last week. <laughs> and it was not a cheap ticket. And as we got that ticket, and even received grace because we were supposed to be charged double with the construction zone. The ticket was supposed to be $630. And we got fined three hundred and fifty or thirteen dollars. And after everything, we opened up some mail we had in the car. We saw a check of three hundred and fifty dollars. Somebody had sent to me. Talk about God's provision. Amen. Amen. So even when God is chastising you and trying to uh, and tell you, hey, you know, you shouldn't be distracted with your phone while you drive, because the Lord had been telling me that for a couple of weeks. Uh, even in that, there's grace. Amen. We serve an amazing God. Amen. Yes, we do. Jeremiah 29, verse 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans of good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. It is so important that you understand that the God we serve has a good plan for you. Regardless of how many mistakes, challenges, Oppositions, trials, God's plan for your life is good. We serve a good God, and He is not the one putting these difficult, uh, challenging situations in our life. Life just happens. In John 16, verse 33, Jesus tells us, says, In me you will have peace. In this life you will have many trials, many troubles. But fear not, I have overcome the world. So what we're talking about, discovering God's plan and God's purpose for your life, it's very important that we understand that God's plan for your life has already been established, but it is not automatic. We have to search it out. Proverbs 25 verse 2 says, It is the glory of God to conceal it. It is the glory of kings to search it out. We have to search out who we're going to marry. We have to search out a career. We have to search out where to live, what college to go to. We have to search out and God will lead us. One of the scriptures that encourages me whenever I talk to purpose is Acts 13 verse 36. And it says, For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers in sore corruption. David fulfilled the purpose of God. Do you know that it is possible for you to fulfill God's plan for your life? If David could fulfill his purpose, could find his purpose, find his future spouse, find his destiny, his calling as a king, then so can we. And we must approach uh, God's call upon our life with a sense of it has already been established rather than looking for something that is not there. It's already there. Before the creation of time, God had a plan for you. And we're going to see through the Word of God what His plans for us was. Before we look how to discover our purpose in life, let's look at how the dictionary of Bible defines purpose. According to the Oxford Diction English Dictionary, purpose means the reason for which something is done or for which something exists. It means resolve or determination as one's objective. Purpose is the Greek word prothesis, and it means shoebread or shoebread, as some people would like to uh, pronounce that. And it comes from Hebrews 9, verse 2. It says, For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was a candlestick, and the table, and the shoebread, which is called the sanctuary. Now, for those of you who may not fully understand uh, some Old Testament stuff, the shoebread was one of the elements in the holies of holies. 
it was put upon the gold mercy seat, where the two cherubims hovered over it, and it was called the bread of his presence. It was symbolic of the most sacred presence of God. It was symbolic of also the twelve tribes of Israel who bear or bore the name of God. And God's purpose for your life is sacred, is holy. And that word prothesis, it means a setting forth, also one of the meanings, a proposal, specifically the shuber in the temple, as exposed before God. Ephesians 3.11, this was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. See that word purpose, and that's what it means. And that word uh, prothesis comes from the Greek word pro. And that word is broken down into two compound words. Pro, which means two words, and tithenia, which means to place, to set properly, to place before, setting forth in advance to achieve a particular purpose. Those words can be translated as consecrated, purpose, resolute, or sacred. It's very important that before we talk about God's purpose, we must understand that God's purpose and plan is sacred. We're not just talking about uh, the next job here. We're not just talking about um, what school you're going to go to. We're talking about God's divine, original intention of creativity. You see, God didn't just create you. It was premeditated. He thought through it. Love is best God chose to create you. Love is best expressed towards something or someone. And God is love. And God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and God the Son, they came together and they said, out of the fullness of this love bubbling within us, let us create man in our own image. He created them both, male and female. God created you for sacred fellowship. God created you to love you. God's purpose for our life is sacred. And this is my definition of purpose in view of all these things that I've shared. Purpose is the sacred revelation of God's written out plan for your life that is fully manifested when we come into agreement with God's plan, which is to be conformed into the image of His Son, Jesus Christ. Romans 8.30 says, And those whom He predestined, He also called. And those whom He called, He also justified. And those who be justified, he also glorified. We see there the word predestination, that I believe is a big word, and a lot of Christians have not fully understood that. Purpose starts with God. In, in Romans 12, 1 to 2, Apostle Paul is he's beseeching the church. And he says, I beseech you, brethren, in view of God's mercy. Offer your bodies, that is the present, that's the shoe bread, set before. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, pleasing and holy unto the Lord. And then it goes on in verse 2 and it says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world. In other words, you just this is a sacred call. You just can't do life the way every other person does life. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will know God's good, acceptable, and perfect plan for your life. Amen. And it says, and this is our true worship unto the Lord. So, what makes us living beings is having God's essence in us, God's bread. In the Old Testament, they call this the Ruach bread of God. In the New Testament, we call this the Numa bread of God. First of all, we're talking about 
ourselves. We must understand that everything about your life is a mystery. Can anybody here explain to me, whether you're a doctor, whether you're a psychiatrist, how something invisible makes us alive? Something invisible creates a neurological network in our brain. Can anybody explain? Faith. Faith? Even faith, man, we're still trying to figure that out. We serve a God who is much, much more bigger than us. He's mysterious. But it takes, through a personal revelation, through faith, we begin to understand this mystery. The Bible clearly teaches us and shows us what this mystery is. So, faith, understanding this divine call. Proverbs 29, verse 18, which is another key scripture I used the last two Sundays. It says, when people do not accept divine guidance, they run wild. Everything about God is divine. Everything about God is sacred, is holy, is set apart. And when people don't accept divine guidance, not just, okay, go this way, or go to this school, or okay, this is what to do with your with your finances. Divine guidance. They run wild. And people are running wild today, people are frustrated, people are confused, people are, are suicidal because they don't understand the divinity of the Numa breath of God that is flowing within me. David, or Daniel, I learned this from Daniel, just understanding the reverence and the holiness that come, that happens whenever we commune with God. You know, somebody's praying, so I just felt the Lord say, man, do you know what that is? To hear the God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, speak to you is divine. To have his leading, Isaiah, I think 30, verse 21 says, and you will hear a voice beside you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Divine guidance. And Daniel said in Daniel 2, 19 to 23, that night, the secret was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven. He said, Praise the name of God forever and ever, for he has all wisdom and power. He controls the course of the world events. He removes kings and sets up other kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the scholars. He reveals deep, mysterious things and knows what lies hidden in the darkness. Though he is surrounded by light, I thank and praise you, God of my ancestors, for you have given me wisdom and strength. You have told me what we ask of you and revealed to us what the king demanded. Wow. God is a mystery. But if we approach him with reverence, if we approach him with thanksgiving, he will reveal to us our purpose. God designed and thought through every detail of your life. But he did this for his purpose, not for your purpose. It's very important that you understand God's good plan for your life is revealed through Christ Jesus. Ephesians 1, 9-10 Making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. So we see there that there's a mystery, but that mystery is revealed through Christ Jesus. We all agree with that. Amen? This word, predestination, is very critical to understanding God's plan and purpose for your life. God only predestinates those whom He foreknew. Romans 8, 29. 
For those whom he forgave, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. According to the Strong's Concordance, the word for new in Greek is prog in usko. I could pronounce that. It means to know beforehand, i.e., foresee, foreknow, ordain, decree, know before. According to the Oxford Dictionary, predestination is a doctrine in Christian theology. It is the divine foreordaining for ordaining of all that will happen, especially with the regard to salvation of some and not others. It has been particularly associated with teachings of St. Augustine, of Hippo, and of Calvin. If there's anything that I need you to take home today, it is this statement. God has never predestined anyone to hell. In this church, we do not preach once saved, always saved. We preach that there is a predestined plan for us in Christ Jesus. And we must respond to this plan. It says, those he foreknew would accept him as Savior are predestined to become just like Jesus. Romans 8.30 Those who be predestined, we say this over and over, so we hear me, so you hear me correctly. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. So those whom he predestined, he called. That word called means invite or to be invited. And it's the Greek word klesis. To call, to summon, calling or an invitation. And we see this clearly in John 3.16. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. See that scripture there clearly refutes that that. Predestination means that there's an elect few that are going to heaven. Who did Jesus call and give this beautiful, wonderful gift of salvation? Can we say that together? Everyone. Everyone. But remember, he sent out this invitation. In Titus 2.11 says that the grace of God has been revealed to all men. Oh man, we serve a good God. People always ask, so, so why did why would God create hell? Why would God, if He's a good God? God has made sure that everyone in His goodness will hear the good news. In, in Romans, it says that His invisible qualities, His invisible nature shows us that there's a God. So even though people haven't heard the gospel just by seeing the sunshine. They're saying there's a God. <laughs> God has invited everyone. Ephesians 4.4, 4, we see a few scriptures supporting that word, call it. There is one body, one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling. That's the invitation. Ephesians 4 verse 1. If therefore a prisoner of the Lord urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling, the invitation to which you have been called. Philippians 3.14 I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling you. You see there that Apostle Paul is making the effort, he's pressing on to receive this prize which God has called, invited him to. We need to make an effort. God has a great plan for your life, but that plan is not automatic. In Jeremiah 29, I think verse 12, it says, And when you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. 
Discovering your purpose in life requires your partnership with God. Romans 8.26 says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. For we don't know what to pray. For us we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Now, if people don't even know how to pray, how are they going to know what to do with their lives? <laughs> if people don't even know how to pray in church about a certain situation, about Ukraine right now, about the world, how are they even going to begin to pray about relationships, about career choices, about what school to go to, about what church to attend? We need divine guidance. And the only way we can fully receive this divine guidance is we, if we first of all understand that everything about us is divine. And when we set before the shoe bread, when we set ourselves apart, our ears apart, our minds, our bodies as a temple of God, when we begin to live holy lives, God will begin to guide us. Because we are divine in nature. Bible says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. If you just live your life anyhow, God's grace and His sovereignty will be there sometimes you begin to, oh, this was definitely God leading me. But I'm talking about, the Bible says that those who are led by God are sons of God. I'm talking about just walking with God every day. I'm talking about having a knowing. I'm talking about understanding that his, his word says he would never leave you nor forsake you. Divine purpose. I believe that relationship, the person you will marry, settling down is the most important decision you can make after receiving Christ Jesus. And I begin to hear this messages of purpose that I'm sharing today, these teachings, and I began to program them in my life. It started, first of all, with setting my life apart. God found me in a very uncompromising situation. I won't go into details. And as I made that effort and began to make a whole, live a holy life, God slowly began to reveal himself. The Bible says, draw near to me, and I'll draw near to you. Then the next verse says, wash your hands, you sinners. The more you begin to wash your hands, the more God, who is holy, will begin to show you more of his holiness. God's holiness is his light. And when God's light shows up, destiny is revealed. Purpose is revealed. And that's how my journey began. I began to seek more of God. I began to read his words. And in those times of sanctification and setting myself apart, and I'm talking about a span of 14 years, praying, because I had done the whole relationship thing. I said, I'm tired of just dating for dating sake. I'm tired of thinking this is the one and then finding out it's not the one. I'm tired of heartbreak. Lord, if there's one thing in life I want to get well, this is it. And I believe that God took me through this long process so I can teach other people. Don't worry, it's not going to take you 14 years. <laughs> and the first seven years, I, I made a vow unto the Lord to give out my affections unto the Lord. So I'm not even talking about. There's one thing I said, okay, I'm not even going to be dating, but no, subconsciously, I learned, I, in that seven years, do you know that attraction is a choice? I stopped myself from getting attracted. I gave my emotions, my affections onto the Lord. The Bible says that in the book of Colossians chapter 3, it says, set your affections on God. And on the seventh year, I had an encounter with God. Jehovah Shammah, which means the Lord that God is present in the midst of thee, revealed himself to me. I heard God's audible voice, and God infused me with his essence. Apostle Paul says somewhere in the Philippians, he says, I have loved you with the affections of God. And God told me, you've tapped into something that not too many people tap into. Walk in the affections, the agony love of God. I'm not trying to say I live a perfect life. I'm trying to say that when you begin to set your life apart, God revealed himself to you. God began to speak to me. God began to reveal to me through dreams, through visions, through his word. One of the things he showed me in his word as I was reading was when God put Adam into a deep sleep. That's the sanctification. That's the holiness. Resting in God. 
And the scripture jumped out to me and it says, I'm taking you through a process and I'm going to put you into a deep sleep. When people are searching for spouses on Facebook, on Instagram, you will be asleep in me. And I will take out of you, out of your side, and make another woman. And I will bring her to you. Literally, sometimes God will speak to you literally through the word. And God spoke to me and says, I will bring her to you. In 2008, my, my brother had become a citizen and he invited me to, come, to become a citizen as a dependent. And the Lord told me, turn this down. Because I promised you that my gift to you, that I will bring your spouse to you. God began to speak to me. God began to show me. God began to tell me her age. God began to tell me the time and the season. God began to show me her physical makeup. God began to even show me she would have a nose ring. At that time, at that moment, an angel tapped me and woke me up. He says, Philip, go to you to the mission and you see your spouse. God had told me to deny citizenship and he would bring my wife to you to the mission in Nigeria. To cut the long story short, I went to you to the mission that morning, walked into the worship service, as soon as I saw her, I knew. It was a knowing. This knowing didn't come from watching movies and building my philosophy based on magazines and listening to Oprah give relationship advice. No. This knowing came from sanctifying my mind, from setting it forth before the Lord for Him to shine His light. Do you know that faith is a gift? So the things I'm saying today, I'm not boasting it. Hey man, look, I've got no, I'm telling you that if you only, if you only put God to test and set your life apart, God will speak to you about every detail of your life. And God says, I'm taking you through a journey so that you will teach about purpose and help people discover God's plan in their life. He had told me, he says, when you see your spouse, you will know. And I walked into that room and there was just this knowing. There was a confidence. I just knew that I knew that I knew that I knew that this was the time, this was the season, and that was the bone of my bones and the flesh of my flesh. I was so confident about it, I didn't even talk to it. I kind of pissed her off. But I went back to my office and the Lord told me, give me 20 days and I'll establish this relationship. On the 20th day, my wife woke up about 3 a.m. in the morning and she felt this overwhelming peace because she too had been setting herself apart, seeking the Lord, putting herself before the Lord. The Lord told her, this is the person you're going to spend the rest of your life. Prior to that time, we had met just about five, four times. Not even had long conversations. So she wrote it down. And then when we had our first long congregation, when I officially asked her out two weeks after, we found out that on the 20th day, not only did God speak to me, but he also spoke to her. And that's how we started planning the wedding. Amen. Now I'm sharing this testimony so that you can apply this into every aspect of your life. God's plan and purpose for your life is beyond your career. God's plan and purpose for your life is it is divine. It is showing you in your career what he wants you to do with your career. How he wants you to go about your career. It is showing you, okay, this is the person and now this is the, how I now want you to begin to serve and love that person. Do you know why there's so much issues, problems in relationships today? It's because God spoke, then they stopped walking with God. It is God who will continue to teach you both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. The Lord is constantly teaching me how to love her. And God is constantly teaching her how to love me. And that's why the relationship is flourishing. God's plan for your life is based on how you cooperate with it. I was, I was going here before I, I signed right. And the word help in Greek means, it means to take hold of opposites together, i.e. to cooperate. You have to cooperate with God. Revelation 3.20 says, Here I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him. 
Everything about God is gentleness. David said it, I think in Psalm 18, it says, Thy gentleness has made me great. And in other translations, it says, You stoop down. That's what gentleness means. Gentleness means humility. Everything about God is humble and gentle. God stoops down to make you great. But it takes sensitivity, it takes gentleness and humility to open the door for God to come and lead you and guide you and tell you, no, this is not right, this is not the person. This is the person. Can't tell you how many people that I had to say no to, how many uh, attractions I had to stop before they were formed because I was constantly listening and trying to walk humbly before the Lord. God's plan and purpose for our life is based on how much you cooperate with God. That's what we call submitting to God. James 4, 7 says, submit to God and resist the devil. A lot of us are finding it so hard to resist the devil, the influences, the distraction. The devil is not the issue. The devil has no power over you. It's the submitting to God that is the problem. Our minds, our bodies are constantly going against God's will. We're looking for purpose. We're looking for direction. You're looking for your spouse. You're looking for your career choices. It's in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 1, 9 to 10 says, Making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose. We found out what purpose means. Which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time. Stop looking for a spouse. Stop looking for a girlfriend. Stop looking for a career. And start looking unto Jesus. He who created you for that person will reveal to you at the right time. Will lead you to the right church, the right, right community. He will lead you to the right job. Because every decision you're making, you don't realize it, is a relational decision. Pastor D, can I? Pastor D is praying in her family. She's got the Lord leading them back to Oklahoma. And that choice, despite her loving this church and being one of the pastors here, is based on family. That's one way God leads. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. The kingdom agenda is not based on your paycheck. When, when adults are, are praying and trying to choose a school, they have no idea, no idea that God is more interested in their salvation than in their education. So in other words, God may not lead you to a particular school if he sees that that school is going to lead that child astray. Every thought, every decision must be holy. And when we make holy choices, they are Perfect, excellent choices. That's Proverbs 3, verse 5. Acknowledge me before all things, and I'll make your path straight. But the acknowledging is hard. If we've missed God's plan, I want you to know that it's okay. You should not feel condemned or you mean awful. So maybe I can live this holy life. That's why we're here, to celebrate God's grace. You see, your plan for your life sometimes is like the GPS. When you miss the turn, it recalibrates. God, that's God working things out for you. And that's why he says, today you hear the word of the Lord, hearken not your heart. Because God's plan for your life can only be delayed. But as far as you're walking with God, regardless of the sin in your life, regardless of the weight in your life, regardless of the wasted years, oh, he's going to recalibrate and he's going to bring you back into his perfect will. That's the good news. That's, why we're, that's what we're here to preach. Grace, grace, grace. Romans 5, 20 says, The law was brought in so that the, the trespass might increase. But where sin increased, grace increased. All the more. It is risky to preach this verse right now in this time and generation, but it's the truth, and it's the truth that sets you free. Some people will hold back this scripture. I don't want them to know that when you sin more, grace abounds more, because I want them to live holy lives. But we can't live holy lives based on the law. 
Fear and rules is never a long time factor for setting people free. We have to be compelled by God's love. It's His kindness that leads us to repentance. And you, the more you let people know, you, you're not doing the right thing right now. You're not living the way God wants you to live. But God is still with you. God is grieving about that situation. But man, He is interceding. He's sending the right people. And He's trying to strengthen. He sees the effort you're making. So rather than look at the condemnation, rather than look at how many times you grieve the Holy Spirit, look at the, at, 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 at the victory and the, the good news, the testimony that, hey, God has already made that grace available. And as you begin to keep your eyes on the grace that God has made available, you will be empowered. You will be empowered. And we're here to lift up Jesus because when we do lift him up, he draws all men. We're here to lift up grace, letting you know that we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But hey, maybe the only reason why it hasn't worked out for you, maybe the only reason why you haven't really been able to hear the voice of God clearly is because you thought that you needed to get right to come closer to God. It's not the contrary, it's the opposite. You come closer to God, and then He will begin to make you right. God doesn't call the qualified. God qualifies the called. Isn't that good news? Galatians 3.19 says, So that why then was the Lord, in? it was given alongside the promise to show people their sins. But the law was designed to last only until the coming of the child who was promised. God gave his law through angels to Moses, who was the mediator between God and the people. Jesus was the word of God made flesh. He was the law. The Bible says in John 1 14, it says, talking about Jesus, it says he was full of grace and truth. Stop living by the law. Stop living by and get into this relationship with God. And begin to worship. Begin to begin to open your heart to the Lord. Let the Holy Spirit begin to draw you closer. I'm a pastor today because I saw that God had made enough grace available. And when I fell, I got up. As the Bible says, a righteous man will fall seven times, but he will stand again. I love this scripture in 2 Peter 3 9 from the message translation because this gives me a balance in grace. Because I've talked about grace, and this grace is available not for us to take advantage of it, not for us to use it to indulge in the sinful nature, but this is why God is gracious. It says, God isn't late with his promise. A sum measure, a sum measure latent. He is restraining himself on account of you, holding back the end because he doesn't want anyone lost. He's giving everyone space and time to change. Also, Paul says, in view of God's mercy, offering your body. God's been giving some of you time. To change, to really begin to ask yourself those hard questions. Am I living for God? Am I seeking His purpose for my life or my purpose? Am I seeking to please Him or to please myself? God has been giving you time and chance to change. But please don't take that grace from God. Also, Paul says, in view of God's mercy, what he did on the cross, that he gave his one and only begotten son. And it's when I began to understand how much God loves me. It's when I began to understand what Christianity was truly about. That's when I began to submit my life to him. You know, it's scary sometimes when God is asking you to give. But God is not an art of confusion. When he says, when he's calling you out of a particular relationship, when he's challenging an area in your life and demanding more self-control, it seems difficult. But everything God is telling you to do is for your own good. 
It brings peace. It brings a sense of well-being. And it, 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 it positions you to hear God there. We were created for His glory. We were created to give Him pleasure. Revelations 4.11, I'll be rounding out some of these scriptures here. It says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, and power. For Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. You were created for God's pleasure. You were created to make God laugh like your children make you laugh. You were created for fellowship with God. I don't know about you, but whenever I come into prayer, I can sense God rejoice. Oh, my son, he's here again. And we begin to talk, we begin to walk, we begin to fellowship. You're not a mistake. God created you because He loves you. God wants you in His presence. God wants you talking to Him. God wants you casting your cares. God wants you bringing your mess to Him so that He can put His holiness upon you. Ephesians, Ephesians 4, 24 tells us that we should put on Christ. We can wear Him like a mantle, put on His Christ-like nature. It says put on Christ so that we're created to be in, in righteousness and holiness. You can't do this on your own. Isaiah 43 verse 7 says, Break all who claim me as their God, for I have made them for my glory. It was I who created them. You were created for God's glory. And whatever God does with you and through you, not only will it glorify God, but you know it will also glorify you. Jesus says, Father, glorify thy Son, so that you may be glorified. I'm glorified in my relationship, and I thank God that I waited for 12, 14 years. God rewards those who diligently seek. He says, it's to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples. Life was created to give God glory, and anything outside of that will keep you feeling unfulfilled and frustrated in some area of life. Acts 17, 28, the Passion Translation said it is through Him that we live and function and have our identity. Just as your own poets have said, our lineage comes from Him. I'm going to invite the worship team to come back and lead us with that song. Open the eyes of my heart.